So the topic for today is erythropoietin therapy in dialysis patients. And as uh, Sridhar sir has already mentioned, uh, erythropoietin therapy has revolutionized the treatment of anemia in dialysis patients. As our dialysis personnel working in uh, various units, we all will be familiar with the treatment of anemia in dialysis patients. So uh, in the next uh, 45 minutes, we'll be discussing about anemia, what is the mechanism of anemia, what are the treatment options, and uh, uh, erythropoietin stimulating agents, and about those, when to start, what is the target hemoglobin, when to stop ESA treatment, what are the adverse effects, and what do trials tell us. So in anemia in CKD, uh, as per the KDGO guidelines, the evaluation of anemia in CKD should begin when hemoglobin level is less than 12 gram per deciliter in females and less than 13 gram per deciliter in adult males. So uh, why are we concerned about anemia? Is it very prevalent in CKD? That is what this graph tells us. So this slide shows in the x-axis, the CKD stage one to two, CKD stage three and CKD stage four to five. And here you can see that the blue graph shows the WHO criteria for uh, anemia. So uh, the about 75.8 percentage of patients in CKD stage four to five fall under the WHO criteria of definition for anemia. And among these patients, about 11.4 percentage of patients have hemoglobin less than 10 gram per deciliter, and 37.9 uh, percentage have hemoglobin less than 11 gram per deciliter, and 62.9 have Hb less than 12 gram per deciliter. When you compare uh, CKD stage 1 to 2 to, uh, with uh, in stage renal disease, you can see there is a drastic increase in the prevalence of anemia. So from this slide, we are sure that prevalence of anemia in end stage renal disease is very common and it is almost as high as around 60 to 70 percentage. So we all know uh, the majority of re the major reason of end stage renal disease is diabetic nephropathy. So this slide compares between diabetic and non-diabetic end stage renal disease. And let's see, is there any difference in anemia prevalence among diabetic patients and non-diabetic population? So you can concentrate on this side of the graph. Here, the uh, x-axis you have GFR, which shows less than 30, that is CKD stage four to five. And here, uh, the dark colored graph is diabetic population and the lighter one is non-diabetic population. And here you can see the diabetic population, the prevalence of anemia in CKD is 52.4 percent. And in non-diabetes population also, it's around 50 percent. So what do we understand from this? So there is not much difference between the prevalence of anemia, whether the patient be diabetic ESRD or a non-diabetic end-stage renal disease. So what is the reason for anemia in CKD? Let's just refresh uh, your last class about ion therapy. We would have discussed some of uh, many of these points, but we would just... Uh, rush through these slides. So chronic kidney disease, what is the reason for anemia? The major reason, as it was mentioned, is decreased erythropoietin or erythropoietin deficiency. So erythropoietin is produced around 90 percentage by uh, kidneys and 10 percentage by liver. So whenever there is a de uh, decreased functioning of the kidney, the normal erythropoietin production does not occur. So what is the normal function of erythropoietin? Erythropoietin, as the name implies, it helps in the process of production of RBCs from the bone marrow. So whenever there is a decreased erythropoietin level in the body, there will be decreased RBC production leading to anemia. Apart from decreased erythropoietin deficiency, there are other mechanisms. So here, CKD per se, chronic kidney disease itself, is a chronic inflammatory state. So patients could have increased inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-6, etc. in the body, and this itself can cause resistance to the erythropoietin action and functional iron deficiency. Even though the parameters may look normal, patients may not, may, may not be having adequate iron for the utilization. So there will be a functional iron deficiency. So all these factors they are, uh, are pertaining per se to CKD, which is, the, uh, which is causing anemia in end-stage renal disease. Apart from erythropoietin deficiency and inflammatory cytokines, there are other factors like RAS activation, decreased GFR, and uh, these can also act to uh, lead on to anemia. So anemia in ESRD is multifactorial. It is not only because of a single reason. It could be due to, we have already talked about inflammation and a decreased erythropoietin level. So what, is the, what are the other effects of inflammation? Let's go through this. 
So whenever there is an inflammation or infection, there are some other molecules which are released from the liver. The, the major one is hepcidin. So the liver produces hepcidin and this hepcidin is very important because this hepcidin can impair with the iron utilization, iron release and in the iron stores. So this hepcidin will cause uh, decreased iron absorption and also it will it decrease the iron release. So whenever there is a decreased iron uh, utility, uh, iron availability, and whenever there is a decreased erythropoietin availability, the bone marrow is not able to produce enough RBCs. So that is another reason why this inflammation can cause indirectly anemia. So from this slide, now we have seen that uh, uh, some of the points have been discussed, this inflammation, then uh, uremic toxins, then decreased erythropoietin production, then uh, there are some other factors too, like blood loss. We know uh, in chronic kidney disease patients undergoing chemodialysis, they require uh, multiple times repeated blood drawings. They will be having dialyzer blood loss and uh, they will be having blood loss even from other uh, like GA tract. There could be patients could be on antiplatelets. There could be occurred blood could be positive. So they could be, they would, could be having blood loss, which could be a reason for anemia. Then uh, patient can have uremic, patients on ESRD, they have uremic toxins in the body. So if the patient is inadequately dialyzed, if patient is under dialyzed, these uremic toxins, what happens is uh, compared to a normal person, the patients uh, with ESR, in ESRD, they have a shortened RBC lifespan. The RBC lifespan will be shortened. So they will be having what? anemia. So that is another... Mobile mobile. So... Uh, uh, so uh, in chronic kidney disease, so all these factors, apart from that, there is a major other, other factors also, like we have talked about uh, the factors which are related to chronic kidney disease, and there are some other factors too. So the major, another uh, major factor is iron deficiency, which is very common. As Sir has already mentioned, iron deficiency is very common in dialysis patients. So CKD patients, so, uh, it, so what the major factors are blood loss, inflammation, then uh, uremic toxins, increased hepcidin because of the increased inflammation, then shortened RBC lifespan and decreased erythropoietin production. And all these factors together can lead to anemia. So whenever we are we considering about the treatment, we have to consider all these factors and then only anemia management in ESRD will be successful. So as we have seen in the kidney disease, where there is accumulation of uremic toxins, there is increased erythropoietin level, and uh, the decreased erythropoietin, there'll be decreased erythropoiesis from the bone marrow and uh, there'll be decreased RBC production. And so there'll be anemia and it's further complications. So uh, this slide comprises almost all the causes of anemia in CKD. So we have discussed about these and uh, whenever we have anemia we should, in CKD, we should not, we should not uh, keep that it, it is only because of CKD itself. It could be due to other hematologic disease as well. So if there is any uh, clinical or laboratorical parameters which suggest that it could other underlying hematologic disease could be there, like patient having uh, uh, pancytopenia or if there is any other clinical indicators, then we have to consider or uh, rule out other hematologic disease as well. So anemia and CKD may not be always due to CKD itself. So it could be due to a marrow disorder. So uh, we have to consider, we have to keep our mind open and uh, see the uh, reason for anemia and evaluate properly. Then hyperparathyroidism is another issue uh, which can occur in dialysis patients and contribute to anemia and CKD. Then hemolysis is another reason. The nutritional deficits. You know, in uh, dialysis patients, uh, uh, they can have uh, loss of water-soluble vitamins like B12 and uh, they could have vitamin B12 and folate deficiency. So if there is B12 and folate deficiency in dialysis patients is also common. So we have to see the uh, what are the causes of anemia in CKD and uh, correction of those and addressing to the etiology itself only will be the treatment, uh, only will be the answer to the proper management in anemia in CKD. So let's see uh, what is the normal effect of erythropoietin on RBC number? What, what is the normal effect of erythropoietin? So whenever if a normal person has anemia, like this shows the less RBC concentration. So if a normal person has uh, develops anemia, what will happen? So there will be a low oxygen carrying capacity of blood because there is less amount of hemoglobin in the body. So this will lead to uh, decreased tissue oxygenation. So decreased tissue oxygenation or hypoxia 
this tissue hypoxia uh, will act as a stimulus for the kidney to produce erythropoietin. So this uh, tissue, uh, with this tissue hypoxia, kidney will try to produce, increase the production of erythropoietin. And this increased erythropoietin will act on the marrow and uh, this stimulates the production of RBCs. And the RBC concentration will come to normal. That's what happens in a normal person. Whereas in a disease, in a uh, non-functioning kidney, this normal mechanism to uh, tissue hypoxia, the normal response to tissue hypoxia does not occur because kidney is not, because there is a decreased erythropoietin production, kidney is not able to act uh, to the, according to the level of tissue hypoxia. And so even though anemia is there, kidney won't increase the production of erythropoietin. So the anemia will persist unless we supplement erythropoietin. So we have been talking about erythropoietin and what we think is erythropoietin, the major effect is only erythropoiesis as the name implies production of RBCs. But not it, it is, it, that's not the only effect of erythropoietin. Erythropoietin has many other uh, functions too. One is the brain. It has a protective effect from ischemia and injury. The ischemic injury, then in the endothelium, it affects the vascular tone. Then heart, it has a protective effect from ischemia. Then myoblast, the white fat, bond, etc. So these are our other functions of the endogenous erythropoietin. So this slide uh, shows the EPO deficiency in CKD. So here we have a comparison between anemic patients, then uh, non-CKD patients, then CKD stage 1 to 2, stage 3, and stage 4 to 5. And this dark portion shows the relative EPO deficiency. You can see that the relative EPO deficiency, erythropoietin deficiency is very prevalent. It's around 80% in CKD stage 4 to 5. And even in CKD stage 3, it's around 70%. And as the person reaches CKD stage 4 to 5, the erythropoietin deficiency is very prevalent, more than 80%. And uh, they can have iron deficiency and other uh, causes for anemia as well. So when we are considering about erythropoietin deficiency in ESRD, uh, this graph is important because it shows uh, two different, two uh, separate graphs. One, the solid line shows the observed erythropoietin level in the body and the dotted line shows the predicted erythropoietin. So here you can see that uh, the x-axis, it is the GFR. So here as the person reaches uh, GFR of less than 15, that is end stage renal disease, uh, the predicted erythropoietin level is here, but what we observe is almost very low. So the observed erythropoietin level is very low in patients with patients in ESRP. So that also underlines the fact that patients require erythropoietin stimulating agents for the treatment of anemia. So we know what are the symptoms of anemia, which is uh, all uh, very common. Patients may come to the OPD uh, with uh, sometimes patients may uh, they may miss the finding of uh, chronic kidney disease. Sometimes they may, patients may there have been instances where patients will be having uh, receiving multiple blood transfusions for uh, uh, symptoms of fatigue and low hemoglobin, and uh, without checking an RFT, patient will be branded as chronic anemia. And when we check the uh, hemo reaction, and that is the time that they realize that it was because of uh, chronic kidney disease that patient had anemia. So there could be uh, anemia can present with uh, fainting, fatigue, angina, heart attack, uh, exertional dyspnea, palpitation, uh, breathlessness, then other so many symptoms. So whenever we have a patient with anemia. Uh, in CKD, what we normally, how do we uh, evaluate anemia? So we have to take a review the history and see if there is any loss, if there is any history of blood loss. And then uh, we have to do the RBC indices and thorough evaluation. So normally, uh, uh, depending on the RBC size, uh, anemia can uh, could be classified based on, uh, based on the RBC size into microcytic, where the MCV, mean corpuscular volume less than 80, then uh, normocytic between 80 to 100 and uh, macrocytic that is more than 100. Usually for a, a microcytic hypochromic anemia is seen in iron deficiency. Then the normocytic is usually seen in anemia of chronic disease and MCV more than 100 is usually seen in B12 or folate deficiency. My iron def this uh, anemia in uh, kidney disease, chronic kidney disease is usually normocytic normochromic but we have to always evaluate other causes because patients can have iron deficiency or other reasons why patients could have anemia. 
And if we, there could be patients which are coming from uh, different uh, populations, like where uh, sickle cell uh, hemoglobinopathies or uh, uh, thalassemias could be there. So we have to always evaluate the cause of anemia before embarking on or before starting on iron or erythropoietin stimulating agents. Or sometimes, as we have told, it could be because of other disease. It could be liver disease or it could be uh, because of a marrow disorder or like myelofibrosis or multiple myeloma. So we have to rule out all, it should not be, should not brand, uh, just because a patient has chronic kidney disease that anemia is because of CKD. We have to thoroughly evaluate the patient and find out the reason and confirm that it is just because of CKD and then only we have to initiate the treatment based on that. So what are the other lab tests that we have to do? One is RBC indices. Then as we have seen, then a reticulocyte count, peripheral smear will tell us about the any abnormal cells or any other uh, cell lines abnormalities. Then marrow study, we have already told if it is indicated to be done. Then uh, you should have, you would have already uh, talked about these in the last class, uh, iron indices, which are very important in the uh, management of anemia. So iron, uh, without uh, proper iron correction of iron deficiency anemia, erythropoietin uh, won't act in the, won't act and it won't be proper. So uh, iron uh, uh, evaluation of iron deficiency anemia and iron indices is very important. So serum iron, total iron binding capacity, then percentage transparent saturation, and uh, serum ferritin should be checked. Then uh, we have to check folate and B12 levels. And as I've said earlier, patient could have uremic gastritis, patient could be on antiplatelets. There could be many reasons why there could be a blood loss via stool. So we have to check an occult blood and stool if it is indicated. So uh, what is the servants? Like when should we check? Uh, so based, there are individual protocols for individual dialysis unit. So usually uh, check hemoglobin at least monthly and uh, transparent saturation and curtain should be checked at least every three months. But if there is a situation like uh, where we uh, think that uh, patient could uh, require frequent testing like recent blood loss or if patient is uh, going for a major surgical procedure or for assessing response to IVIN or if patient requires more than the previous ESA dose, then we have to keep a regular follow up on these parameters. This graph, uh, this graph compares the uh, prevalence of uh, low iron indices in CKD between men and women. Here, uh, this is not per se to CKD st uh, in stage renal disease. It is for all patients with GFR less than 60 ml per minute. And here, uh, you can see that uh, in women, the percentage is around 72.8 percentage and in men, it's nearly 60 percentage. So low iron indices in CKD is very prevalent. So what is the importance of these uh, transparent saturation and ferritin? So these are some of the scenarios where we have a low hemoglobin and a transparent saturation low. In such patients, we think that it is because of the, it is, uh, these reports show that it is a deficiency of iron, which is to be addressed first. And such patients should be treated with, uh, iron, uh, with IV dose of IV iron with repeated pores and until the transparent saturation improves. Or if uh, hemoglobin is less than 10 and uh, transparent saturation is more than 30, such patients are usually started on erythropoietin stimulating agents. And uh, in this situation, patient has HB more than 10, but T-site is less than 20 and ferritin is also on the lower side. Such patients, we have to consider it as iron deficiency. Then uh, here in this scenario, hemoglobin is less than 10, saturation is more than 20, ferritin is more than 200. So we don't have to treat them with iron or ASA, but the problem is we cannot leave these patients alone and uh, think that they are uh, they have a proper iron status and hemoglobin. Usually what will happen is over the next few months, there could be a reduction in these levels and patient can develop anemia. So there comes the importance of surveillance. So we have to keep a regular follow up of these patients and revise the treatment strategy. Otherwise, uh, the adhering to a normal regime may not be sufficient for all these patients. So there are situations when we should avoid iron. So, excuse me. Okay, we administer IV iron to most dialysis patients, but uh, some there are some situations where we should avoid iron. One is uh, in patients with bacteri bacterial or fungal infection, or in patients who have uh, transparent saturation more than 40 or serum ferritin more than 700. Then if there is history of hypersensitivity reaction, in such situations, we should avoid iron. So earlier we have told that there could be a functional iron deficiency state. 
So what is this functional iron deficiency state? Uh, as I have said earlier, chronic kidney disease, there could be presence of more and more inflammatory markers like uh, interleukin-6 and this in increased markers will lead to increased hepcidin level in the body. And uh, this increased hepcidin production in the liver and uh, with reduced renal clearance because of the non-functioning kidney, which is not able to clear off the hepcidin, uh, the level of hepcidin in the body will increase. So what will happen because of increased hepcidin? This hepcidin will impair the absorption, tissue distribution, and recycling of the iron. So uh, there will be decreased absorption of iron from the duodenum, and there will be decreased release of iron from liver, and uh, there will be decreased release from post-prenic sequestration. So uh, there will be impairment with the absorption, distribution, and recycling of the iron. So this is what occurs in as a functional iron deficiency state. So parameters may be normal, but a patient will be having a, a difficulty to util utilize the available iron. So coming to the treatment of renal anemia, so the major factors we have considered, so the major four important things are, one is uh, first and foremost is iron, iron therapy. Without a, a correction of iron deficiency anemia, erythropoietin therapy won't be successful. Then, you know, patients with uh, in CKD stage five, they'll be having uh, anorexia, uremic symptoms. So nutrition support is very important. They could be having other deficiency of other vitamin deficiencies like B12, folate. So patients require nutritional support. Then adequate dialysis. Under dialysis is another reason. Even if erythropoietin is supplemented, hyporesponsiveness can occur because of inadequate dialysis. So adequate dialysis is also very important than erythropoietin. So these are the important aspects of treatment of renal anemia. So let's see what is the history of erythropoietin stimulating agents. So it started from 1985. So it was pre-19, before 1985 itself, the gene for erythropoietin was cloned. It was genetically engineered. And the first study of erythropoietin in renal anemia was uh, reported in 1986. And initially, uh, the concern was more for patients in, with uh, cancer, malignancy-related anemia. So studies were published in 1990. And then by 94, uh, ESAs were approved in uh, Europe for treatment of cisplatin. Cisplatin is an agent used in cancer treatment for cancer-related, cisplatin-related anemia. And uh, then uh, uh, by 2000 to 2002, uh, ESAs were approved for all chemotherapy-related anemia. And then uh, by uh, 2004, then there were some studies which were out, which was uh, which is suspicious of the risk-benefit ratio, whether whether the risk is more. And then there were other studies on uh, the effects on other uh, function. And then uh, there came numerous studies on um, newer molecules of erythropoietin stimulating agents. When did ESAs become the cornerstone of treatment of anemia in ESRA? Let's see what is the history of ESAs in the treatment of anemia of end stage renal disease. So in 1989, FDA was FDA approved ESA use in CKD and uh, increased use of agents to reduce transmission. So the, uh, the attraction was uh, that this uh, molecule helps, uh, helps us to reduce the uh, number of blood transmissions and raise hemoglobin. By 2000 to 2005, average hemoglobin, it was 11 to 12.5 and, uh, early, data of, and uh, early data of increased mortality in cancer patients came out. And uh, 2007, FDA uh, issued a black box warning of safety. And 2008, FDA warning about increased risk of cancer, thrombosis, and they wanted to reduce the target hemoglobin to 10 to 12. Then average hemoglobin was kept at 11.5 to 12 through 2011. By 2011, it became more conservative recommendation from FDA and upper limit was kept as 11 gram per deciliter. And then by 2012 also, average hemoglobin 10 to 11 gram per deciliter and average monthly avoiding alpha dose around 10,000 units per week. So what are the, let's see what are the benefits of ESA. So erythropoietin stimulating agents has multiple, like it can be cardiovascular benefits or uh, non-cardiovascular benefits. What are the cardiovascular benefits of erythropoietin stimulating agents? One is reduced heart rate. It reduces the uh, reduction in the high cardiac. You know, anemia is associated with a high cardiac output state. So there could be correction of anemia helps the reduction in the high cardiac output. 
it reduces the anginal episodes and myocardial ischemia so it, uh, there is a regression of the left ventricular hypertrophy and uh, there will be stabilization of the left ventricular dilatation and uh, another factor is increase in the whole blood viscosity and apart from the cardiovascular benefits uh, there are some other some non cardiovascular benefits of atherosclerotic stimulating agents one is obviously it reduces the need for blood transfusion and it improves the quality of life symptoms improves exercise tolerance sleep improves immune function improves nutrition and muscle function and improves platelet function so these are other uh, benefits of erythropoietin stimulating agents so let's see what are the erythropoietin formulations and what is the erythropoietin therapy so how do esas act we have seen that high tissue hypoxia is the usual uh, a uh, response to or usual stimulus for erythropoietin release from kidney which does not occur in a normal uh, which does not occur in a end stage renal disease patient and when we supplement erythropoietin it acts in the bone marrow it as uh, uh, it acts in the bus forming unit and colony forming unit then erythroblast reticulocytes and forms the rbcs and helps in the correction of anemia so what are the formulations different formulations of erythropoietin So recombinant human erythropoietin was uh, produced by gene transfer into mammalian cell line Chinese hamster ovary cells. It was a 165 amino acid backbond with one O-linked and three N-linked glycosylation, and they were based on the change in this uh, glycosylation and uh, with the change in the glycosylated molecules. There were different formulations which were produced. So epoietin alpha, then epoietin beta, then dabepoietin alpha. and methoxy polyethylene glycol epoietin beta or also called cera continuous erythropoietin receptor activator this epoietin alpha and beta forms in the first generation dabepoietin alpha forms the second generation and methoxy polyethylene glycol epoietin beta or cera forms the third generation of erythropoietin stimulating agents so first generation you know epoietin alpha beta and the second generation dabepoietin so the uh, this is called mercera also continuous erythropoietin receptor activator so epoietin alpha or beta the half life is 8 and 1/2 hours so it is usually given either iv or uh, subcutaneous so by what we should know is uh, the bioavailability of intraperitoneal is too low so in patients on in pd uh, we should not sub, uh, uh, administer it intraperitoneal because the bioavailability will be very less and uh, subcutaneous bioavailability is 20 to 30% even though availability is only 20 to 30% uh, it has a long half life so patient gets uh, more be patient gets benefit out of this so half life of epoietin alpha is only 8 and 1/2 hours so uh, compared to iv subcutaneous bioavailability is only 20 to 30% but it has a prolonged half life for dabepoietin alpha it is second generation it has two extra n linked chains so this is the this is the uh, uh, it has two extra n linked chains and uh, the it, uh, it imparts more stability to that molecule and its half life is around uh, three times that of uh, the first generation molecule its half life is 25.3 hours it has a lower clearance rate and uh, it's administered once in one or two weeks then sera it is a pegylated derivative it is a long half life half life is 130 hours it is once monthly administration uh, iv or sub q and both iv and sub q has a similar half life iv has around 130 uh, 130 hours and sub q has around 139 hours so almost similar half life so it is called mercera also and uh, when we consider about erythropoietin stimulating agents there are some other molecules which were available early but withdrawn one is pegenocetide This pegenocetide is earlier called hematite, and uh, it is a it is an EPO mimetic peptide. I mean, like like action is similar to EPO, but it was really un completely unrelated to native or recombinant erythropoietin. But it was uh, the major use was uh, there is a situation called pure red cell aplasia, pure red cell aplasia, which is because of anti erythropoietin antibody. That means when we give erythropoietin for the correction of anemia. some patients some of the patients can develop antibody to the erythropoietin and this antibody can aggravate the anemia or patient can de suddenly develop severe uh, anemia that is called pure red cell aplasia due to anti epo antibody and uh, this pegenocetide was useful in the treatment of anti epo mediated 
antibody mediated pure red cell aplasia but uh, it is not there much uh, in the market because it was withdrawn due to severe anaphylactic reaction so it's not available so uh, we have said earlier about the uh, hepcidin and the chronic inflammatory state and what hepcidin does to our body and what is the problem of hepcidin having a high hepcidin level in the body because it impairs with the iron absorption utilization storage and release so we have seen that slide so what can we do for that so hypoxia inducible factor or prolyl hydroxylase inhibitors or hif stabilizers they are the new drugs in trials so these have been uh, these are undergoing global and regional phase 3 clinical trials and uh, some of the molecules have been uh, made available in japan like daprodustat so these were studied in uh, ckd patients and uh, for uh, the action is this causes stimulation of endogenous erythropoietin and uh, it promotes iron mobilization and utilization so what is the conclusion based on this study which was published in isn uh, that stif stabilizers demonstrate efficacy in the treatment of anemia of ckd so they have not only the effects beyond they have effects beyond erythropoiesis and iron metabolism regarding the cardiovascular safety but uh, these uh, molecules are uh, not had uh, mentioned that they are uh, long term efficacy long term safety uh, profile have not been uh, available till now because they are not widely available for use so these are the newest newest drugs for erythropoietin stimulating agents this hif stabilizers increase the endogenous epo production and uh, they are orally activators all the molecules that we have told earlier are either iv or subcutaneous use and these are orally active molecules and uh, the they have uh, the names are roxadustat daprodustat vadadustat and molidustat these are the orally active agents hif stabilizers which are uh, in trials so this slide uh, as i told earlier uh, this erythropoietin stimulating agents this show slide shows the comparison between the half life after iv administration and subcutaneous administration here you can see apoitin alpha and beta in healthy volunteers the mean half life after iv administration was 6.8 and after subcutaneous administration was 19.4 and uh, dabepoitin alpha in patients on dialysis the half life was 25.3 after iv administration and it was 48.8 after subcutaneous administration and uh, methoxy polyethylene glycol apoitin beta or mercera in ckd patients on dialysis after uh, with mean half life is almost similar after iv and subcutaneous administration it's around 139 hours so how to initiate erythropoietin stimulating agents as i've told earlier we should always exclude other causes of anemia and check iron status and patient should be iron replete mid patient should be correction of iron any iron deficiency should be done otherwise uh, then only we have to consider the uh, starting erythropoietin stimulating agents so hb level at which esa to be started is usually by around 9 g per deciliter and uh, the common hb target is 10 to 12 g per deciliter not like a normal person where we target more in uh, end stage renal ckd or end stage renal disease the target is little bit on the lower side why is it so we'll see later then uh, starting dose of apoitin is 25 to 50 iu per kg and for dabepoitin the dose is 20 to 30 microgram once weekly and for sera it is 30 to 60 microgram once in two weeks or it could be given once a month also and this slide shows the dose equivalence when we convert from one molecule one formulation to another like apoitin beta to dabepoitin or sera what is the usual conversion it's just uh, for a um, uh, guidance only it's not like absolute uh, but usually for an apoitin beta unit of the one uh, 8000 unit per week iu per week we can convert it into dabepoitin around 40 and sera up to 150 microgram per month and what are the adverse effects of esas the major adverse effects of esas are uncontrolled hypertension that will be very common to you all of you will be uh, will, uh, would have experienced the side effect of erythropoietin stimulating agents in dialysis unit so major side effect is one is uncontrolled hypertension 
then the potential risk of cancer progression, then thromboembolic complications like stroke, cardiovascular events, and venous thrombosis. So what is the reason for retropoietin induced hypertension? There are various reasons like vasoconstriction of resistance vessels, increased levels of ethethylene, and then uh, initiation of acetylcholine mediated vasodilatation, then calcium influx in smooth muscle cells of vasculature, and causing platelet aggregability. All these factors can cause retropoietin induced hypertension. And whenever we have told that there is an increased cardiovascular risk, so what is the reason for increased cardiovascular risk with erythropoietin? It could be because of the increased blood viscosity, then hypertension, then direct effects of erythropoietin stimulating agents, then oxidative stress from IVIN. So all these factors can cause increased cardiovascular risk. Then ESAs and cancer. There have been various studies where uh, it was found that ESAs, erythropoietin stimulating agents, when we administer in cancer patients, is there an increased risk? So this study, all these studies were done in uh, head and neck pain patients with malignancies, uh, various malignancies like head and neck cancer, metastatic breast cancer, lung cancer, lymphoproliferative cancers. And uh, here the right side, we can see uh, adverse outcome. So almost all of the, all, all the studies show that there could be hazard ratio, hazard ratio for death uh, is around 1.3. That is clinic, uh, P value is significant. That means in cancer patients, uh, we always have to think twice before administering erythropoietin stimulating agents. There could be patients with malignancy who are undergoing uh, dialysis. So in those patients, we have to keep, discuss with the, uh, uh, them regarding the uh, option of uh, and the side effects of erythropoietin stimulating agents because so many a times the, it could be risky is more than the benefit. And there is hypo-responsiveness to ESA. That means uh, hemoglobin does not increase from baseline after one month of appropriate dose. Or there could be more than 50% increase in dose requirement of ESAs. Like uh, earlier person was a uh, patient was uh, having a normal stable level of hemoglobin and suddenly there could be an increase in the requirement of erythropoietin stimulating agents. Then we have to find out is there any other reason other than or which is, a, is there any other new development like an iron, it could be either an iron deficiency or inflammation, and we have to check whether the patient is getting adequate dialysis or not. So inadequate dialysis or iron deficiency anemia could cause hyporesponsiveness, means the optimal response to erythropoietin stimulating agents won't be there. And there could be other factors like B12 or folate deficiency, then blood loss, then marrow disorders, poor compliance, then anti-EPO antibody, AC inhibitors, all these are other factors which have to be addressed. And this EPO induced, uh, I have told earlier, some uh, uh, when we mentioned about vaginocytai, that it was used in uh, EPO antibody induced pure red, cell, pure red cell aplasia, where EPO antibodies were formed in these patients. So this slide shows that uh, this patient uh, was on epoitin alpha sub-Q, 50 IU per kg per week, and hemoglobin was fairly uh, around 11 gram per deciliter. And uh, suddenly, they, then they had an increase in dose, 75 IU per kg per week. And you can see that uh, there is a sudden drop in hemoglobin to around 6 gram per deciliter. And that was the time where uh, the reason for uh, sudden uh, severe anemia was evaluated and bone marrow was done. And bone marrow was showing pure red cell aplasia. And there was a sense of anti-EPO antibodies. This is a situation where how anti-EPO antibodies can cause pure red cell aplasia and patients will require recurrent blood transfusions. So there are uh, various trials in um, anemia in CKD. And uh, based on this, uh, we have found out what are the risks, what is the benefit of erythropoietin stimulating agents. Just to mention the few, uh, mention a few, the 2006 great trial and choir study. Then uh, 2009 major study was treat. And uh, in 2019, we have Roxidostat. Uh, uh, these studies were actually to find out what is the risk and benefit of erythropoietin stimulating agents. As I've mentioned in the previous slides, uh, initially the erythropoietin stimulating agent was uh, used kind of widely because it was helping to reduce the risk of blood, uh, reducing the requirement of blood transfusions. Then later in cancer patients, we found that it is a cause of increased risk also. So that was the time when we thought that like whether to reduce the target hemoglobin or not. So what is what is the consensus based on these trials? So let's see this slide. So this is the major four randomized controlled trials of hemoglobin raising in chronic kidney disease, NHCD, COIR, CREATE, and TRAIT. And this population was uh, end-stage renal disease on dialysis. 
And if you consider the first graph, NH, uh, first trial, NHCD, initially you can see that hemoglobin target was 14. But did they achieve the target? No, because the uh, primary outcome was first MI. And uh, what was the risk? There was an increased risk of primary outcome resulted in early study interruption. They couldn't even complete the study because of the increased risk. And uh, patient has, uh, patients had higher rate of thrombosis in the target group. And in the next study, choir study also, the target was kept as 13.5 versus 11.3. And uh, here also the composite uh, of MI hospitalization for chronic heart failure, stroke, etc. were assessed. And uh, the result was increased risk of primary outcome. And in the CREATE study also, the hemoglobin target was 13 versus 11. And uh, here uh, there was <clears throat> one thing we have to notice was whenever there was a hemoglobin was high, patients had an improved quality of life, but uh, there was a trend towards increased risk, but it was not that significant. Then in TREAT trial, <coughs> TREAT study, uh, the target was 13 versus 9, but there was a higher rate of stroke in such patients. So in the, uh, when we talked about erythropoietin stimulating agents, uh, we have talked about uh, the newer molecule, Sera or Mercera, that is uh, the longest acting one. And then uh, the study, which was published in American Society of Nephrology, and uh, this is a uh, multicenter randomized controlled trial, uh, which is comparing the uh, conventional erythropoietin, like erythropoietin uh, alpha or beta or rabipoietin with, with the newer molecule, with the third generation, that is comparing the conventional erythropoietin with the third generation erythropoietin to see whether it achieves the target or is there any increased risk of risk associated with the newer molecule. So here we can see that in these CKD patients uh, with uh, the now sample size was around 3000 and they were followed up for a median of three years and four months and uh, patients were randomized into two groups. About 45.4 percentage were uh, on metoxy for, on SERA and 45.7 percentage were on uh, conventional ESAs. And uh, the primary endpoint was uh, the time to first occurrence of death, non-fatal MI and non-fatal stroke. And here you can see that in the uh, SERA group, the all-cause mortality was 39.6 percentage. And in the conventional group also, it was around 39.5 percentage. So what do we understand from this study? From this study, we understand that it is not having an increased adverse effects compared to the uh, conventional one. And uh, in patients with chronic kidney disease, it's uh, epoid, this sera or metoxy polyethylene glycol epoidin beta was non inferior to the conventional short acting erythropoietin stimulating agents uh, in respect to the, with respect to the cardiovascular events or all cause mortality. So, this study was showing that its efficacy, uh, this uh, uh, risk elements were almost similar between the third generation and the conventional ESAs. And uh, we have talked about uh, oral daprotostel, which is an HIF stabilizer. And uh, this study uh, was done in Japan. And uh, it was also published in uh, Journal of American Society of Nephrology. It was uh, done in 271 hemodialysis patients. And uh, this was a comparison between darbipoietin alpha and daprotostel. I told the daprotostel is an orally active agent. Here you can see darbipoietin as injection. And uh, it was a randomized double-blind trial and uh, patients were followed up for one year. And uh, the target hemoglobin uh, in the darbipoietin arm was 10.8, uh, and in the daprotostat arm was 10.9, and uh, hemoglobin target was achieved after one year, 90% uh, in the darbipoietin group, and 88% in the daprotostat group, and serious adverse events were 27% uh, in the darbipoietin arm, and 15% uh, in the daprotostat arm. So um, the problem with this molecule is it's still not available widely. And uh, so uh, we don't know the long-term safety profile of this molecule. Even though this graph shows that compared to darbipoietin, has a has less adverse events, we cannot be sure about the long-term use since it is not in use. So long oral uh, daprotostat was non-inferior to darbipoietin alpha as measured by hemoglobin over weeks 40 to 52 in Japanese hemodialysis patients. So there is another uh, study of uh, types of erythropoietin stimulating agents and mortality among patients undergoing hemodialysis. So we know there are short-acting agents and long-acting agents. 
and this study compares the uh, mortality and other side effects of short acting agents versus long acting agents and when we talk about short acting agents it's mainly apoitin alpha and beta and long acting agents are dabipoitin alpha and uh, sera and uh, in this study it was a large study which are uh, done in it was done in japan almost to around 2 lakh patients underwent this study uh, uh, and it was a two year follow up and uh, the conclusion is long acting esas use might be associated with higher rate of death than short acting esa use among patients undergoing hemodialysis so that is another reason another uh, that is the conclusion of this comparison between short acting and long acting esas so this is the um, uh, long acting esa use it was associated with increased rate of cardiovascular death including death from cardiac disease and stroke and the rate of non cardiovascular death and in particular death due to malignancy and infectious disease was also elevated in the long acting esa users so now we know initially why we have kept a low target of hemoglobin in esrd these are based on these trials and uh, usually the uh, the desired hemoglobin is around 11 to 11.5 gram per deciliter so we are reaching the uh, end of the study end of this uh, session and this uh, so we have to remember anemia is very common in the ckd and uh, iron deficiency and erythropoietin deficiency are major causes and uh, patients always it's not like a one time check and then we leave the patients with iron or uh, erythropoietin prescription that patients require monitoring of iron indices and hemoglobin regularly there comes the importance of sur uh, surveillance and patients could have other vitamin deficiencies or develop new developments like uh, iron blood loss and those factors need to be addressed and uh, when we consider the erythropoietin formulations we have to know that uh, most of the time if, uh, sub q administration have a longer duration of action it has a longer bio even though bio availability is less it has a long half life and uh, when we compare the formulations as first generation second generation and third generation third generation molecules have longer duration of action and uh, there are some orally acting agents as well that is called uh, hif stabilizers and uh, which are in trials and not widely in use and uh, they are the uh, promise in the um, erythropoietin stimulating agent therapy it is just a uh, consensus of this so <coughs> optimal anemia management requires all these factors patient care patient should be compliant on the treatment then iron therapy then erythropoietin stimulating agents and adequate dialysis is very important so always under dialysis should be a reason under dialysis will be a reason for it apo hyporesponsiveness so that factor also should be addressed thank you